Good morning everyone. Today I'd like to share some information about gears. I have picked up my toys from my past. That's Fischer Technik. I played with that a lot and I've gathered a lot of these as you may see. Still works fine today and they are especially nice in order to show the principles and the basics of gears because they nicely demonstrate how different gear ratios may work, what the pros and cons of these different gears will be. So come along with me. I'd like to explain and share some thoughts and the basics of these gears. So this is a classical spur gear. An axle in the center to be able to rotate and a line of tooth around. And whenever you attach a gear that interconnects, you're able to rotate and these two work together. You can change the size of the gears and as long as the module, that's the type or the measurement of the teeth they have to fit together, they work together. Already notice that these two engaged gears work counterclockwise against each other. So if I do this with the clock, the other gear goes against it. So they in principle form a figure eight. If you want to make sure, for instance, that you have two gears that work the same direction, you have to install a gear in the center to balance that. So with these three wheels, we can rotate the right one to the right with the clock. The center goes against the clock and the left one goes with the clock. As mentioned also earlier, you can in principle describe a figure eight continuously. You can also change, of course, the center one to a very small one if there's no space or place, for instance. So therefore you can see the same. They work both in the same direction. And of course you can also alter this against here. Quite simple. That's it for Spogers. You've already noticed I have different sizes. So whenever, in this case, I try to move them from the back, put them here a little bit more in the center. If you look at this, we can talk about the gear ratio. Gear ratio is the ratio between this and this gear. This is a very small one. Let's assume this is a 10 teeth gear and this one has 60. Means 10 to 60, it's a one to six ratio. Whenever I turn this, six times the big one only moves one time or on the other side if i move the big one one time the small one already moves six times we can change this also if we have for instance a similar gear this is a one to one ratio means if i rotate this right gear one full turn the second one is rotating the same so always be careful if you change this you change the gear ratio as you already know from your bicycle a gear ratio can also help you to increase power or speed means if I rotate here at a certain speed, the driven gear, the one that follows, is slower. 
if I, for instance, rotate here on the big one, the smaller one rotates faster. So therefore you are able to reduce or increase the speed. Be careful, whenever you increase the speed by turning the big one against the small gear, the force or the strength of the system is reduced. In this case also almost like a sixth of it. And if you are turning the small one to a bigger one, your forces are increased. Like on your bicycle, in the lower gears you go up the hill and in the highest gears you can actually pedal down the hill very quickly. That's it for spur gears right now. So, the next one is a chain drive. And the chain drive, it's the same as you already know from your bicycle, needs a sprocket and a chain. And then you are able to transfer the rotation from one axle to the chain to the other sprocket. You always have to make sure that the tension of the chain is correct. If it's too loose, the gear may spring over. And if it is too tight, the friction will be too high and therefore you may also have problems with your drive. What's really interesting, with a chain for instance, you can... Oh, I need a little spacer in here. If you, for instance, insert another sprocket just in between these, the sprocket in the middle moves in the same direction. So this is an ideal situation or gear if you want to make sure that you distribute your movement to many different axles. Assume this could be the drive shaft of a motor and here we have different axles of a sunshade, a lamella, a horizontal lamella, something like that. And then you are able to move the drive shaft, the right axle, and then you are able to control the different louvers all the same way. Here we have two simple wheels and these wheels are interlocking with the little knobbies here on the side and they already behave a little bit like a beveled gear. A beveled gear is a gear that transforms two rotating axles in a 90 degree angle. So we can see from this in here we really have a beveled gear. This is a beveled gear. I may be able to zoom in even more. So have a look around here. If I rotate the axle, the rotational movement is turned around 90 degrees. So the wheel over here is moved when I... This could already be a drive shaft from a car powering a wheel. Notice that you can also reverse this, so whenever I turn the wheel, the drive shaft is also turning. The next one is a warm gear. We have the warm gear here, which is a spiral, like a thread from a screw. And whenever you turn this the connected gear is actually rotating. What's very interesting is that this is a self-blocking mechanism. Means if I move the gear here, you won't be able to move the axle over there. So therefore you can only initiate a rotation by rotating the handle the warm gear 
instead of the driven pinion over here. This is for instance um, seen in steering mechanisms in cars but also in off-road vehicles for instance because if you have a system in your drivetrain like that the car will have an automatic brake if you descend a hill and you stop somewhere in the middle so therefore it won't go down by itself because it's self-locking. Quite interesting, nice to have and it also allows for very precise movement because here you can see you have to turn a lot to turn the gear around. Based on the same principle, using a thread and having a nut, in this case this red block over here, interesting because this is able to turn a rotational movement from the axle or the thread, the spiral, into a vertical up and down, a linear movement. Here I have placed this linkage. This could be, for instance, a, um, a car lifter, a jack. So therefore you are able to apply forces on the spindle itself and then the little lever goes up and down. And this is also a very strong mechanical solution. That's also why it's used for uh, a jack to lift your car because with a couple of rotations you are able to increase the momentum and therefore you are able to lift an entire car which weighs one and a half or two tons or something like that. You can also think about by getting rid of the elements here for instance, placing elements here to the side that you can just create a, you have to think about, if you just move, you create a linear movement left and right, for instance, if you turn that, so therefore you are able to create a linear movement from a rotation of the spindle. Here we have a very unconventional system. It's made out of a boom that can pivot and an egg-shaped wheel that can rotate. And by this you are able to create an up and down movement. So from the circular movement of my egg-shaped wheel and the little handle I'm rotating here, you are able to control the movement of the beam on top that goes up and down. This is back then a very common mechanic to drive a power hammer, for instance, at a blacksmith. And therefore, the mechanic could be driven by instance from a water mill. Here we have a little thing that is, um, yeah, it's a, a robotical grapper. I've taken this from a robotic arm where it was used to grip onto pieces by clamping down to components. The movement is done by a right-handed and left-handed screw. These black and grey blocks have a nut inside. Usually this transmission block is attached to a motor that via a warm drive runs the little gear over there and then the element is turning to the left and closes the grabbing element or if turned around the other side it opens its jaws. So therefore you are able to create with one direction of the engine an open or closing movement done by a right hand screw and a left hand screw. That's also the reason why these blocks have different colors to identify them. Right hand screw like in a normal standard screw and this is a left turning screw and therefore you are able to change directions by this rotation. 
Here we have a steering mechanism. This is from a car. What's really interesting in this case, what I would like to show is the principle of linkages. So what we can see here underneath is, here is a link system. This is a link that has a pivoting point here and a pivoting point here. It's the same also what we have on top of here. So there are connections that can move. And in this case, whenever I rotate the steering wheel by bringing the rod two forward or backwards, we are able to turn the direction into a steering mechanism that goes from back and forth, in this case, to a left and right angle. This is sometimes handy whenever you have to bring movements around the corner, direct them in the opposite direction or something like that. A very interesting uh, mechanism that um, yeah might come in handy to know. That's also a system that can move a rotational movement into a linear movement and this is called a pinion and rack system. While the pinion is in principle a gear, a spur gear in this case, and then we have a flat unrolled geometry that engages with the teeth and that's called the rack. And the rack is able to ride alongside the gear and whenever you rotate the pinion the rack will move left and right. You have to make sure that you are able to guide the rack somewhere along. For instance here if it already is goes out so make sure you have it nicely guided and what's also interesting you are also able to move the pinion or the axle or this wheel in this case by moving the rack left and right and at the very last we have this contraption that is capable of turning a rotational movement into a stroke uh, back and forth movement. This is what we know for instance from the old steam trains. By having a axle fitted to the wheel here, accent out of the center, so eccentrical, you are able to move, and I can also rotate it from the back here, you are able to move this and then due to the hinge of the link that is attached to the gear you are able to move these elements. That's what we call a push rod or a crank shaft. It's the same principle we also found in combustion engines. So that was the last one. I hope I was able to explain some principles of these where they might suit or not but at least they give a good start for you to think ahead have a look around browse the internet ah by the way i will add a little link to a fantastic youtube channel it's called thang 10049 i don't know exactly i always run with the numbers but he has made so many nice mechanical contraptions of all kind that will be, yeah, it's kind of like the pro level that may also show you some movements that um, are required and needed for your prototype. So, hope to see you soon. Bye!